Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar on how to improve workforce inclusion with technology. Today is a special webinar because we have uh, Andrew Spence with us. So a little introduction about uh, Andrew for people who do not know him already. He is a globally renowned and uh, thought provoking speaker on topics related to how organizations can harness technology and uh, build uh, better strategies. And uh, he has worked on over 30 complex transformation programs with the organizations like John Luby Partnership and Novartis, and also other government services, including health, prisons, and transport. Andrew is uh, also one of the top uh, 100 HR tech influencers by uh, Human Resource Executive and HR Technology Conference. So thank you so much for um, doing this webinar for us, uh, Andrew. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. So uh, today we are going to be talking a lot about how uh, you can improve workforce uh, inclusion with tech and uh, why it, it's important to give more focus on inclusion in today's scenario and how HR interventions can actually work. So that's about it. And uh, Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Workers have died from COVID. Some occupations have had more exposure to the risk of disease than others. And of course, there is a diversity and inclusion angle to this. In certain front frontline roles in the pandemic, women do 75% of the jobs. Now, our experience of the pandemic is influenced by our age, health, gender, ethnicity, location, wealth, and occupation. And when we work, we've got a reasonable expectation that our health is not impacted. HR leaders have done a great job in the last year keeping our organizations going, whether that's um, uh, in care homes, supermarkets, or, or in deliver delivering products. Now, there's three things I want you to take away from this webinar today. One, the pandemic example is an illustration of why workforce inclusion should not be an afterthought for organizations, but should be core to every important business decision that's made. The approach to monitoring and improving workforce inclusion is related to other org goals. You need a well-tuned workforce measurement engine and need to take a holistic approach to these complex issues. And the third thing is workforce inclusion is an area where HR can demonstrate leadership in the organization as what I call people scientists and workforce technologists. A little bit about me. Now, my passion is to make work much better, to make work better. Now, I've always had an eye on the future. Uh, I did a master's uh, degree in, in artificial intelligence in the mid 90s. Now, this was a long time before Alexa and Watson, I can tell you. And I've worked on more than 30 global transformation programs in a variety of settings, from Gothic psychiatric hospitals and prisons in London to vast train depots in Berlin, and I've proudly survived visioning sessions in Los Angeles. I've been really lucky to work in teams where a diverse set of people have come together and achieved great things. But I've also seen some rather sad cubicles and situations where individuals' potential has not been achieved, and they could be due to organizational barriers, discrimination, bias, and unfairness, all outside of their control. So I advise organizations, foundations, startups, scale-ups in different industries. And as you might have noticed, I'm based in the UK, in Brighton on the south coast of England. My interest in technology has led me to do work on blockchain and HR, um, and that's been influential in, in building the next generation of work infrastructure. And I, I write um, a newsletter called the Workforce Futurist Newsletter, which you can subscribe to. Now, before we get into it, I am driven. My work is driven by questions. And here are the questions I'm going to cover today. Number one, why is workforce inclusion important? Two, what is workforce inclusion? How is it measured? Three, how are employers using technology to support diversity? Four, do HR interventions in diversity and inclusion actually work? And five, what can HR do to improve inclusion? But before I start with my questions, 
I have a question for you today. So I'm going to load up a question. Bear with me. So please tell me, where are you working today? A, on the beach. Don't worry, we're not going to tell the boss. B, in the office. Well, I know, I know some are starting to head back. C, in a coffee shop. If you are, make mine a, a double espresso, please, if you would. Or at home. And there's no need to tell us if you're still in your pajamas or not. That's up to you. Let's look, look at the results. So two thirds of you are at home. And um, actually, a third of you are in the office. So this, uh, you know, there's a trend here of people heading back to the office. Maybe a few more are heading back to the office, which is interesting. Now, I want to ask you another question. You've come on this webinar to find out more about technology and workforce inclusion. Let me load up another question. So, why is workforce inclusion important for your organization? A, duty of care, you know, it's the right thing to do. B, ultimately to improve productivity. Or C, reputational e.g., you know, employer or customer branding, uh, avoiding things that go very badly wrong for your organization. Or maybe you have another answer. Now, looking at the results here, all of you have said duty of care. It's the right thing to do. And 10%, in fact, have said reputational employer customer branding, which is interesting. Well, do you know what? That they are all related. They are all related. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer there. Um, but let me tell you, give you some thoughts. There is now an expectation that organizations do have a focus on diversity and inclusion. Nearly half of companies included on the S&P 500 index currently have a chief diversity officer. According to LinkedIn data, the number of people globally with the head of diversity title has doubled over the last five years. And the chief exec of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, has a sixth of his bonus tied to diversity measures. Also, there's a belief that this focus on, on diversity and inclusion will impact the bottom line. According to McKinsey, companies in the top quartile for diversity of exec teams were 25% more likely to have above average profitability than companies in the lower fourth quartile. They observed that the greater the representation, the higher the likelihood of outperformance. And of course, we all want to avoid branding failures. Uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, is a humanitarian organization that does great work. You might have heard of them. But it launched a TV ad in Canada and it had images of crying black kids treated by an all-white medical team. And there, were, there was accusations after that advert of reinforcing racist stereotypes. Very unfortunate for, for their employer brand. So all these things are relevant and important. Um, and, the, and there are many reasons. But in, 2000, in 2021, we shouldn't have to make the case for workforce inclusion for a fair and equitable society, but we still need to. In diversity, there is beauty and there is strength, Maya Angelou. She was a fascinating woman and, amongst other things, a poet and a civil rights activist. Listen, I'm in a good mood today. And um, I'm going to read you a poem while you sit on the beach, in the coffee shop, or mostly at home. We love and lose in China. We weep on England's moors and laugh and moan in Guinea and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways we differ, in major we're the same, from a poem, The Human Family. And building on the talent and workforce inclusion angle from Sridhar Vembu, who is the chief exec of Zoho and the co-founder, who said there's enough latent talent in the world that's waiting for an opportunity at Zoho. We believe in providing the opportunity. And my point, I'd reinforce that cognitive diversity would be a differentiator in competitive industries, basically getting the best brains and talents together, working well in a team is going to be key. So what is 
workforce inclusion. The term inclusion and diversity are often used interchangeably, but they have different meanings. An inclusive working environment is one which everyone feels that they belong without having to conform, that their contribution matters and they're able to perform to their full potential, no matter their, of what their background is, identity or circumstances. Diversity is about recognizing difference. It's acknowledging the benefit of having a range of perspectives in decision making and the workforce being representative of the organization's customers. Here's some facts for you that you may or may not know. In the USA and UK, female representation on executive teams rose from 15% in 2014 to 20% in 2019. In the representation of ethnic minorities in the UK and US exec teams, stood at only 13% in 2019, up from 7% in 2014. Only five Fortune 500 CEOs are black. And at Apple, 9% of employees are black, yet only 3% of leadership. So there's progress being made, but, but it's clearly not enough in terms of the expectation of, of a broad society. And differences include visible and non-visible factors, for instance, personal characteristics, background, culture, personality, work style, accent, and language. And it's important to recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach to managing people does not achieve fairness and equality for everyone. People have different personal needs, values, and beliefs. In the UK, age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage, civil partnership, uh, pregnancy, maternity, race, religion, and belief, sexual orientation are protected characteristics covered by discrimination law to give people protection. And neurodiversity is a growing area of workforce inclusion. It refers to the natural range of differences in human brain function. Um, it's used to describe alternative thinking styles, which might include dyslexia, autism, and ADHD. Of course, anyone who's experienced discrimination can, can, can can say that it impacts an individual's well-being, performance at work, and intention to stay. It can adversely affect employment opportunities and result in failure to recognize um, potential. It can also result in significant legal costs and compensation um, as well. And in organizations, when there are diversity issues, we get to see a visible evidence of um, problems um, of, of a problem or, or, or what I'd call the symptom. But underneath that, there are complex connected roots to these problems uh, that we don't see in family, society, cultural regulation. So it's too easy to make the wrong assumption about why the problem exists. So one of our roles in HR as people scientists is to investigate why this problem is happening and to solve it properly, not just take out a weed, but to stop them growing in the future. I have another question for you. So in your organization, what's the biggest diversity and inclusion challenge that your company faces? Uh, inequality in pay and benefits, for example, the gender pay gap, bias in hiring and promotion, social justice, equal access, or, or maybe uh, significant others there. Let me look at some of the results you're, you're, you've got here. So I think all of them are represented by some people um, on the webinar today. Um, definitely bias comes up high in hiring and, and promotion with 40 odd percent. Inequality in pay and benefits, definitely an issue. Social justice, equal access um, is definitely there with 30 percent. So that's, that's an interesting spread um, of, of challenges. And if I look at uh, uh, wider surveys, the biggest reported barriers to inclusion include issues with leadership involvement, uh, poor data, and organizational silos. And I'll come back to these issues as we go through some of the, uh, some of the examples. So what are the common workforce inclusion challenges? Well, according to Gartner, the main inclusion challenges fit into these categories. One is fair treatment. For example, the statement employees at my organization uh, who, help the, who help achieve its strategic objectives are rewarded and recognized fairly. 
integrating differences so employees at my organization respect and value each other's opinions. Decision making. Members of my team fairly consider ideas and suggestions offered by other team members. Psychological safety. So I feel welcome to express my true feelings at work. Trust. Communication we receive from the organization is honest and open. Belonging. People in my organization care about me. And diversity. Managers at my organization are as diverse as the broader workforce. Every single business problem we encounter has an inclusion aspect to it. Here's a big example of this. Um, Zoom back to the office. Now, I think a third or 40% of you on this webinar said that you're working at home today, which is pretty typical of, uh, of many cities around the world where it's estimated that 30 to 40% can work remotely. And now we're in the process of the great return, if you want to call it that. But there's emerging evidence that the transition back to the office is more likely in male-dominated organizations and that it's less likely to suit women. So in planning for a return to the office, we're not planning hybrid work or remote work. It's just work. It's the way work is now. Now, I've included a link to uh, my guide on zooming back to the office at the end of this webinar on a hyperlink. And there's some examples of how companies have approached that. But designing work means ensuring that activities are aligned with business goals, that the operating model is effective, that we can listen to the workforce and make changes as the business needs. And it also makes, uh, meaning the, the small things that matter too, like re-establishing team rituals and recognizing that small talk for remote workers is important too. How do we do that? On our Slack channels? On WhatsApp? I don't know. And we also need to look after employee wellness uh, with reference to my previous webinar, which I think you can watch still with Soho. And it also includes the fairness principle. So most workforces include so much diversity along many different axes. One axis or category is how a work, worker is contracted. We've got employees, suppliers, freelancers. So whether a worker is working predominantly at home or at an oil refinery or a supermarket, there needs to be some consistency of employee experience. As I've mentioned before, every change to an organization has an inclusion and fairness component. And in, returning a, a, in planning a return to the office, a question to ask is, are you treating each category of worker fairly? I'll leave that with you. And I mentioned the importance of um, teams. All great work happens in teams. This photo is the research team at the University of Sask Saskatchewan's Intervaccine team. And if you think of the achievements of your favorite Olympic sports team, your vaccine development collaboration, or local healthcare team, at work is gradually moving away from hierarchies of talent to teams of collaborative networks. And these need to incorporate the best talent from any source available. Um, what types of solutions are adopted by employers? Well, you're going to be very familiar with these general HR practices used by employers to resolve inclusion and diversity and other issues. So here are some more specific examples that I know about. You know, there's diversity committees that review every decision to hire, promote, or change pay. So these managers are held responsible for making sure diverse candidates are treated equally and have the right to undo or audit a decision at any time. And there's programs such as JP Morgan Chase, who have got Advancing Black Leaders Program. So this was launched in 2016 when only 3% of the firm's executives or senior managers were African-American, and it aims to help the bank recruit and hire external black talent and retain and develop the talent that it already has in-house. Uh, BHP, the mining company, um, has worked with its outside equipment providers to improve boots, helmets, and clothing offered to women employees. Now, presumably, this is because they've, they were originally designed for men to use. So it's decided to bring in its vendors, contractors and consultants along on the, on the company's uh, diversity and inclusion journey. And of course, we can use technology 
to support diversity and inclusion challenges, which I'm going to come on to next. But at this point in the webinar, we're about halfway through. And before we go on to some examples of companies using technology, does anyone have any questions? Um, if you don't have any to mind, we can always cover them at the end. Let me just have a look at an, any questions. Let's have a look there. So there's no questions at this stage, which is cool. And, and I'm going to go on to the next uh, part of the webinar around workforce technology solutions. There's so much going on in workforce technology. In fact, there's a new investment uh, category called work tech. And in, in one of my last latest articles, I identified 24 work tech unicorns, private companies valued at $1 billion. So, you know, HR, HR tech is, uh, is on the investment radar. It's hot at the moment. Um, and in areas such as employee sentiment, um, using artificial intelligence in recruitment, for example, using blockchain for resumes and CVs, and I'll explain some of the benefits of those, talent platforms. And actually, on the right-hand side there, you can see me with my pal, Harry, the HR robot there. Um, I don't think he's coming to replace our jobs just now. So there's all sorts of technology available for companies. And it's not just for the megacorps. For example, with software as a service, smaller companies with under 500 employees can try out the software. And that also includes Soho Recruit, which includes both permanent and temporary staff hiring. And with this technology, for our product designers, it gives us loads of design questions. Now, I took this photo or these photos when I was in Las Vegas at a technology conference in the days when you could actually travel, if you remember them. Um, and all the tech vendors use chatbots in, in the photo. But can you spot a trend? Well, I think you've noticed Jane, Evie, Olivia, Maya, Ali all appear to be female. And the World Economic uh, Forum found that nearly 80% of data science and AI professionals were male, 22% were women. Now, with nearly 80% of uh, team men, what could possibly go wrong? You know, an app is just a tool, algorithms used on data, and it certainly isn't gendered. Uh, but product designers struggle with the challenge that people respond better to an app that has human characteristics. So we just have to be careful when designing these new tools so that they don't just reflect a narrow view of society. Um, but here are some examples of using tech to improve workforce inclusion with some mixed results. The first example um, I will share with you, uh, maybe not the best one, but it gives us valuable lessons. A few years ago, Amazon tried to build an AI machine to hire the best technologists. The idea was to be able to take all their applicants, it might be uh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, and give, get the best five candidates based on the past criteria of success. Now, AI works on pattern recognition, literally trying to find a close fit to a template that has been trained over on millions of iterations. Now, the only problem is that the typical software engineer looks a bit like me, a hairy man. So over millions of iterations, the machines were trained to screen for past hires, not their future target hires. So the pattern recognition software was actually screening out words with women in them, like women's chess club. Now, to be fair, this was done years ago. It was recognized and it was fixed. And of course, AI is very useful. But a lesson from this is we do need to use the right tools for the right job. OK, so the second example. So with 80% of software engineers are uh, guys, let's flip this gender gap problem around. How can we use AI to hire more women into these teams? Now, one suggestion is to anonymize job descriptions and using tools to make tone and language more inclusive. Tweaking job descriptions will not shift centuries of conditioning, but achieving more balanced and cognitively diverse teams might improve design decisions. 
As anyone in HR and recruitment will know, JDs are, are often subject to plenty of cutting and pasting. I'm sure none of you have done ever done that. I know I haven't. Employers are using AI technology to statistically analyze response patterns to different words in the job description. So with gender responses, for example, the phrase work hard or play hard or coding ninja attracted more men to adverts and words such as adaptable and creative attracted more women. Now, I know what you're thinking, no surprises there, but you might actually think of other scenarios where you could use this technology. Now, the faithful resume or CV if you're in Europe. Did you know the first CV resume was invented by Leonardo da Vinci in 1482 when he applied for a job with the Duke of Milan? Now, in retrospect, his key accomplishments included creating the most famous painting of all time and invented the helicopter, but back then, even our Leo had to apply for a job like all of us. Today, the more we know about a candidate, the more grounds for bias we have. Thankfully, a new infrastructure for work is being built with verifiable digital career wallets. It's going to make it much easier to apply for different types of work. This infrastructure is currently being built by the main players in the HR technology and staffing industry. And for individual workers, maybe the next Leonardo or James Bond, this will allow us to find suitable work much more effectively. Now, I'm sure most of us, including 007, will still need to pitch for work in the future, but our data will be handled differently. An example is from an industrial manufacturer. They uncovered that as women move through the hiring process, more were dropped during the interview stage. So they took specific actions to reduce unconscious bias and increase the success rate of women and minorities entering and advancing through the hiring process. Now, another example I want to mention is, is, is I've mentioned the importance of teams. If you think about it, many of our management and HR processes are designed around the individual. And many employee surveys ask the employee directly. But I don't know about you, I suspect there's a bit of survey fatigue going on. A different approach uh, looks at the actual socializing behavior of, of employees to see if different groups behave in different ways, always with their consent, by the way. Organizational network analysis, or ONA, has proved to be effective in diversity and inclusion initiatives, including monitoring collaboration patterns used by gender, age, or ethnicity. ONA looks at passive data uh, from actual behavior, e.g. email metadata, and active data from surveys. And this can highlight potential conflict areas where intervention might be needed. So I know of a software firm that found there were gender differences in promotion to manager, even though the graduate intake was 50-50. By looking at the socializing behavior, they were able to make interventions such as mentoring to reduce gender balances which is a good positive example. And my final example, well, it's not really a technology example per se, but I wanted to include it. Workers who come from lower social class origins in the United States are 32% less likely to become managers than those who come from higher social class origins. And PwC has an inclusion goal to apply the same level of attention to the disadvantages of social class uh, that it was already applying to gender, ethnicity, and race. And the company has a goal to help 25,000 young people to develop workplace skills through programs with schools and colleges across the UK. Um, so that has a particular focus on social mobility, uh, cold spot areas, as they call them. So how do we measure workforce inclusion? Well, um, a survey in the UK found that 70% of employers report on gender, but only 20% report on uh, black, Asian, and minority ethnic diversity. And the legal requirements change around the world. Um, and that also includes people data, can include pay, promotions, 
employee turnover, grievance data as well. So it's always important that we only measure workforce data if we have a reason for doing so. Uh, understanding the nature and extent of organizational challenges, for example, the gender pay gap, um, uh, inequality in career progression, or barriers to, uh, to participation in work for those with disabilities or caring responsibilities. Now, another method to improve workforce inclusion is to identify and, and root out bias in your management and HR processes. You can conduct a review uh, and make uh, high impact changes. So us, uh, us silly humans, we're susceptible to many types of bias from affinity bias. We feel as though we have a natural connection with people who are similar to us to confirmation bias. You know, we look to confirm our own opinions um, and I've been known to hold a few and pre-existing ideas about a particular group of people and, the, and apply these to HR processes. Another thing you can do is to consider adopting standards um, uh, like ISO, HR management suite, or investors in people. And these can provide principle-based uh, frameworks and guidelines uh, for your people policies and working practices to make sure they're bias-free. Uh, an example of a company measuring workforce inclusion is Sodexo. They developed a diversity scorecard that's reviewed and reported on a monthly basis. Um, and it captures, for example, how many women and minorities are hired, retained, and promoted. Also, with products like Soho Recruit, you can utilize recruitment analytics and also combine this with employee sentiment data. Now, I have my final question for you is, I've mentioned a few examples of technology and non-technological solutions, but do they actually work in your, in your experience? Um, I'd like to say, surely yes. Some people might be a bit dubious, not really. And others might have an open mind. I'm not sure really. Uh, show me the evidence you're shouting. Looking at the results, well, a quarter of you say surely yes. 13% uh, are saying not really in your experience, which is honest. And over half have no idea. So let's look at what some of the scientists uh, who have looked into this have found out. Now, we, to do this, we need to use an evidence-based management process to identify the root cause of inclusion challenges. So um, sources of evidence might include practitioner expertise and judgment, uh, like from you and me, evidence from a local context, critical evaluation of the best available research evidence, um, and perspectives of those who may be affected by the intervention. It's critical to assess which practices have a better chance of working in your organization and to avoid knee-jerk reactions, for example, uh, off-the-shelf training. Do the interventions actually work? What's the evidence? Well, in a study on prejudice reduction, Pallock and Green found of the hundreds of studies we examine, a small fraction speak convincingly to the questions of whether why and under what conditions a given type of intervention works. We conclude that the causal effects of many widespread prejudice reduction and interventions, such as workplace diversity training, media campaigns, remain unknown. In other words, they're not sure, it remains unknown. I think one, one challenge for the industry is to use, is to capture better data and, and, and to act, and for HR, the role there is to look for different sources of evidence as people scientists. There's some other things to consider from an evidence-based management perspective. You can look at the causes of inequality, but it still might not tell you about solutions that are going to work. It's always good to start with a clear, specific problem or opportunity. And of course, all evidence is flawed. You're never going to find the perfect study or, or research that's going to tell you what to do, but it should be considered. Nothing is certain. So I'm going to bring you on to the summary. 
workforce diversity and inclusion is a prerequisite of building successful organizations. To change behavior, organizations need to develop relevant goals and metrics to get buy-in from stakeholders and communicate effectively. Well, that's the theory. In practice, many organizations require a big shift in mindset, culture, and practices. And you also need the right data and technology to make workforce decisions. Now, for those on the webinar, here are some mistakes to avoid. Now, some of you, I certainly do, might recognize some of these mistakes. So one is not doing the root cause analysis of a specific workforce problem. Two is going for the easy fix, falling for the fad. Three is promising a solution that has little chance of working. Four, focusing on one particular group or issue at the expense of others. Whichever group you look at, um, you still need the infrastructure to do the measurements and maybe uh, surveys. And the root cause, uh, pr uh, the root cause might actually be impacting other groups too. And for those who've worked in global organizations, uh, uh, people have often fallen for the problem of not taking into account local contacts. We've all probably made that mistake. So here are some tips for HR to improve workforce inclusion. I think this involves listening to all workers, to hear what they're saying and to act in a meaningful way. Technology is not the whole answer. It can help improve workforce inclusion if implemented sensibly using evidence-based practice. And HR has a key role in ensuring people are safe at work and also have the conditions to flourish. For HR leaders, this can mean ensuring you emphasize the role of HR as the workforce scientist as well as technology evangelist. So I would say to summarize, adopt a holistic approach to workforce design. Listen to workers. This is a critical business process, not a HR one. Employee sentiment, feedback, and voice are, in, are important for hiring, retention, engagement, and also have a direct representation of your customer experience. Evaluate what works in your organization. You need to be a bit skeptical of some of the marketing claims out there and do your own research. Try new technology. It's easier now when you've got SaaS, you can do pilots, free trials. Try out the technology in small groups. Um, to see whether it actually can help you improve the situation. Use pilots. Uh, you need to maintain a well-tuned workforce measurement engine, capturing the right workforce data across the employee life cycle. And only measure data if you've got a good reason to do so. I think you need to empower workers to be more productive, but don't spy on them. There's lots of uh, instances of this at the moment with workforce surveillance. Just because we can measure it doesn't mean we should. Cast the net widely. For example, with improvement ideas, uh, and you've heard PwC's uh, ideas around uh, casting the net more widely for social inclusion. And pace yourself. Longer term changes, structural changes take time. Prioritize ruthlessly with high impact, lower effort changes. Now, for those of you who are uh, interested in this subject, as promised, um, as promised, not only have I provided you today with a poem, but I also provide you with some useful resources to take away too. So here are some, uh, including um, my articles on improving workforce inclusion and returning to the office, uh, resources from the Center for Evidence-Based Management and Science for Work, and two papers that go into real depth around managing diversity, two PDF reports that you can dive into um, uh, for more insights. So hopefully we can share those with, um, with uh, the audience today. And finally, I would like to say, there's a compelling moral case for improving workforce inclusion as the right thing to do, but there's also a business case for improving inclusion. Three things, that I want you to take away from this webinar today. 
The pandemic example is a great illustration of why workforce inclusion should not be an afterthought and should be core to every important business decision made. The approach to monitoring and improving workforce inclusion is related to other workforce goals. And workforce inclusion is an area where HR can really demonstrate leadership in the organization as people scientists and technologists. In minor ways, we differ. In major, we're the same. Good luck, and I hope you and your family and organization stay healthy. Keep in touch with me on Twitter at Andy Spence or by subscribing to Workforce Futurist newsletter. And I would like to finally thanks to uh, Princey and Soho people uh, for inviting me to speak today. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I really hope you all enjoyed the session. So uh, we'll see you soon in another one, uh, hopefully. So uh, have a great day and um, stay safe. Thank you.